probably proctored him a whole bunch of them. Uh, but anyway, Exodus chapter number 10, we're going to finish this, get into chapter 11 this morning. Uh, we've been watching Pharaoh. Uh, uh, I think he's going to confront God. It's an amazing thing that uh, he just thought he was tougher than God was. I still go back to the frogs. Uh, boy, when those frogs got in, they got in their bedrooms, they got in their kneading troughs, they got in their ovens, they got in everything. I, I thought about old MacDonald had a frog, E-I-E-I-O, and he talked about here a frog, there a frog, everywhere frog, frogs, and they got tired of that, so they called again. And he called Moses and said, entreat the Lord. He said, I'm a sinner. He said, my people are sinners. He said, we're sinners. He's God, entreat the Lord for me. And Moses said, when shall I entreat him? And he said, oh, tomorrow be all right. Oh, boy, I'm going to tell you what. He thought he was a tough bird, didn't he? He stood up in front of God and uh, stood up in front of Moses. Now, when you get to chapter number 10, I want to read the last part. He's offered them three compromises. One, he said, well, ye that are men can go. Can't take your families. Then he said, well, you just can't go very far. And then he told them, well, you can go, but you got to leave your livestock and your possessions here. And I, and I thought about how Satan works on God's children. You know, he wants, you get saved, and, and he said, well, you know, just, you don't want your family saved. Well, we want our family saved. It's not just, it's a household salvation that we're looking for. But a lot of people, they get saved. They never really live a consistent life for Christ that would compel anybody to want to be a child of God. The second thing, he said, just don't go very far. Listen, you get saved, just don't go very far. You know, you don't want to get too religious. Huh? You, just want to, you don't want to be different from this world. You want to blend in. Yes, I call them chameleon Christians. They they. They sit on a green leaf and they turn green and they sit on the bark of a tree and they turn gray and they kind of blend in everywhere. You know, God's children ought to stand out everywhere. At Antioch, they were first called Christians by unsaved people. Christian was not a word that they normally referred to themselves. They were believers. But when the world saw them that had come to Christ, the world said they're like him. They're like Jesus Christ. They're Christ-like. That's what the word Christian. And the third thing, he said, well, just leave your finances behind. I believe you get saved. God, hey, God gets everything you've got. By the way, it's his anyway. So when we get down to chapter number 10, now they've had it up. Look at verse 27. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He would not let them go. God had told Moses in advance that he was not going to let them go. This was not, this should not have been a surprise because we're going to look at a verse. As a matter of fact, we'll go down to verse 8 of chapter 11. Slide down there with me just the last, the last sentence in that verse. And he, that's Moses, went out from Pharaoh in great anger. You know, that was the first time I had ever seen that when I was studying through. I read it. You know, you read the word of God, but you're not careful you are reading the Word of God, but you're not comprehending the Word of God. We've got these things where they want you to read through the Bible once a year, and I want you to do that. But if you read the Bible without comprehension, you are wasting your time. One habit I got into years ago, I'm a speed reader. I got into stand reading. I mean, I, that's why, if you'll notice, a lot of times on the songs, I get on the wrong line. I see all three and four stanzas at the same time. And I've got something else on my mind distracts me a little bit, and I'm just going right off of the line below you uh, and, and do that. So what I have to do, and sometimes I just let, uh, let my uh, computer or whatever read for me out loud and me follow along. You ever notice when somebody's reading the Bible to you up here and you're following them, you get so much more out of it? start seeing things, all right? So what happened was, he got angry in verse number eight. He went out from Pharaoh. Listen, Moses got mad. That's the first time that I've ever seen Moses get mad. You take his life, he's 80 years old. There's, there's, there's nothing said about anger. Now, I knew he took an Egyptian's life, but there's nothing said about anger in there. So what happened was, God now has hardened his heart. Verse number 28 of chapter 10, Pharaoh said unto him, get from me, and he 
said, now you take heed to thyself. See my face no more, for in that day thou seest my face, thou shalt die. He told Moses, if you come back this time, I'll kill you. You know, he's always had the power to do that. Most powerful man in the face of the earth, and here's Moses with a staff in his hand, telling him what God says, what he needs to be doing. Now, normally in that day, with a Pharaoh, who was the most powerful man on the face of the earth doing during this, you know, he had different dynasties that came up. Probably the one of the oldest of dynasties, Babylon is being actually the oldest. But Egypt, boy, you're talking about antiquity. You go back, uh, you can go back right now, four and a half to five thousand years in time. If you go over to Egypt, you go to these pyramids and things, most of those dated about 2500 uh, BC, about the time when Abraham was coming into the land over there. Most of them built at that time. So there's real antiquity there. But what he said was now, I've got the power I've had all along. You come back, he said, I'm going to put you to death this time. Verse 29, and Moses said, thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. Now that's important because of what's going to be said in chapter 11. But when you look down in chapter number 9, we are 11 in verse number uh, uh, 8 and down in there, we find that he's still at this point in time in the presence of Pharaoh. He hasn't left yet. Because Pharaoh said, if you leave and come back, I'm going to put you to death. And he said, you've spoken well. So when we get chapter 11, verse number 1, and we start dealing with some things here, you need to understand God is dealing with Moses while he's standing in front of Pharaoh. He didn't have to go out somewhere by himself and God speak to him out there. He hasn't left yet. See the word and? And and puts that this context right in with chapter number 10 that word and ties them together and puts them on an equal plane so he hasn't gone anywhere yet so here he is moses said thou hast spoken spoken well i'll see thy face again no more he said hey don't you come around me anymore and moses said you don't have to worry i won't now and the lord said unto moses now he's still standing in, in front of pharaoh he hasn't gone anywhere yet the Lord said unto Moses, yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Now, we understand he's going to take the life of the firstborn. But how would Pharaoh know what he was going to do if he had left and God spoken to him later? He, he's not going back. He's still standing there. So while Pharaoh, him and Pharaoh were having this little talk, Pharaoh said, I'll kill you. Moses said, all right, you've spoken well. You won't see him again. And God is start speaking to the heart of Moses because he's still got one more thing that he wants Pharaoh to understand before he leaves. And the Lord said unto Moses, verse 1, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, and afterwards he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Now that altogether means None of the compromises. It's not going to be just a man thing. It's not going to be just don't go very far. It's not going to be you've got to leave anything behind. God said, when I get done with him this time, he's going to tell you to get everything you've got and get out of town. So he's, he's talking to him now. Look what he said in verse 2. Speak now in the ears of the people. Let every man borrow of his neighbor. He's talking when he gets ready to leave here. This is what God wants him to do. Let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. He said, I want your people to go to these rich people and tell them I need to borrow what you've got. I'm not talking about going borrowing an axe or a chainsaw. We're talking about their gold, their silver, their jewelry, everything they've got. God is not only going to let Moses and, and Israel go out of that with everything they've got. They're going to take everything that Egypt has got at the same time. He's going to spoil Egypt. Now, notice verse number three. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. How, how could this thing happen? God did something in the heart of the Egyptians to allow this to happen. You know, God does that with lost people. 
God's able to take a circumstance to where you're having a lot of problem with some unsaved people, and God's able to turn their heart the way he wants to. Now, the Bible said in the Old Testament, as the rivers of water, he turned at the hearts of the kings, whithersoever he will. I believe that God could take Joe Biden up there and turn him completely around in his shoes without even saving him. Have him do whatever he wants. Kamala Harris. Listen, God has to allow things. I believe America is where it is right now because God has allowed it for this particular time. That's why I said, when the election's over, we're going to pray for those in authority over us to be good citizens. You can go vote again, 2022, all right? Go right back to the polls all over again, and we'll find out what's what. But God's going to have his way. Now, he's going to have his way of the Egyptian people. He's going to give them favor. Then notice in verse 3, moreover, the man of Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servant and in the sight of the people. What has God done through the first nine plagues? He has made Pharaoh look like a complete failure in front of Moses. God has taken Moses and elevated him. Notice what he said. He said he elevated him and, and, and in the sight of these people, he was very great in the land of Egypt. This man that came back was great in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, in the sight of all his people. So what has been systematically happening, I dealt with the magicians. They turned around finally and told Pharaoh, hey, this is the finger of God. You don't need to be withstanding him. This is something we cannot do. They can do some of the little plagues, and you know, they, they've got magicians' trick. And you say, well, how they do that? Satan's got a lot of power, folks. You'd be surprised what he can do. If you go to the book of Job, Satan called down fire from heaven. Satan caused a great wind to come up against Job. Satan put the balls on his body. A lot of these things we see today and people say, well, this is something God's doing. If it's something God's doing, it'll line up with what God said. If it's contrary to what God said, it's not something God's doing. You need to understand. You know, the Bible said in the last days, if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. What do you measure people by? The word of God. First John, I think it's chapter four, verse number one said, try the spirits. A lot of spirits out here working, all right? A whole lot of them, not all of them are good spirits. There's a there's a battle going on. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and high places. He named these things. Listen, if God would open your eyes like he did in the days of Elisha, Elisha said there's more for us than there is for them. And God opened his servant's eyes, and he saw the chariots of fire all around those mountains up there. There is a spiritual world out here today that has all types. Everything's clamoring for our attention, and not all of it is of God. A lot of it is done in a religious realm, but it's still not of God. If it's contrary to the Bible, it is contrary to God. I want you to understand that. This is the measuring stick that we have right here. This old King James Bible is right. Well, if you live by it, if you believe it, if you, if you stay with this thing, you'll be all right. So what happened was all these people, hey, the magician said, Springer of God. Now God starts making a difference between Goshen and Egypt. You know, everything's tearing up over here in Egypt at the time. Hey, they sent spies over to Goshen and checked them out. Nothing going on. Man, they had light in their houses. You know, they, they didn't have flies and lice and all this stuff over there. So they saw, the people saw that God was judging Egypt, but not judging Israel. So we find that he had sight in all the people. Verse 4, Moses said, now, God's given him orders. Now he's going to start speaking back to Pharaoh. Moses said, thus saith the Lord about midnight, will I go out into the midst of Egypt? Again, I, I go back to that old movie, The Ten Commandments. How many have seen that? They, they say, show this fog coming down and going through the streets and all this and people dying. 
Then there are some say, well, an angel, God sent the, the death angel down. The Bible said God said he'd pass by. This is something that God is doing, all right? He said God said that he'll pass by. And he said, verse 5, that all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill. What's behind the mill? That's your mill hills, all right? Uh, you live in mill hills back where we come from. They were coal mining camps. A little town of Erlin, Kentucky that we were raised in was started by the St. Bernard Coal Company back in the early 1850s. And uh, they, they mined that coal out. They built little shanties. I got to tell you, well, I went to, a, Barbara and I went a couple of years ago to a railroad museum. How many of you have ever been to Townsend, Tennessee? All right. It's right right outside. If you're going to Cades Cove, you go through Ware's Valley. Everybody's familiar with that. When you get uh, down to Townsend, you hang a left to go to uh, Cades Cove. But if you hang a right, you go down, they've got a small railroad museum down on the side of the road. I was interested. Uh, Barbara and I had more fun kicking around to the right than we did to the left. And we just spent the day in Townsend down there just running around. But my daddy was an engineer on the railroad. Uh, I, I used to, by the way, drive those trains. You don't have a steering wheel. They stay on the tracks real well, okay? So all we did, I sat in that engineer's seat and had a thing that had notches. And you pulled it out of a notch and up and into a notch. And what it does, it started increasing the power. And that's the way they increase the power. So Dad would set us down and he'd let us do, be the shifters. He'd tell us when to shift. Boy, we thought we were big. We arm hanging out the window like that engineer shift and that thing going. That was before uh, they stopped letting people, you know, nowadays everybody will sue you if they get hurt. We used to get a little bag lunch. Dad, we lived a mile from the railroad, what they call the roundhouse. That's where they turn the trains. You'd see these things where they turn the engines, they called it the roundhouse. Dad pick up the engines and head to the coal mines, he'd stop. We lived on the railroad track and we'd have our little bag, we'd run, get in the engine, ride with him. And then coming back, we'd get in the caboose. The little caboose has got that little top part. There's two bunks up there. And one on each side and a little stair. Boy, we thought we, we were really big. But anyway, let me, let me get off of that. Hey, man, I'll get lost in that. Uh, but towns in there, what they did, they showed the first mobile home. What they did, they, they, they had not only steam engines, but they had these steam engines that sawed and cut logs. And they carried them, and when they went to log a place, they had these little houses that were on uh, these little uh, sliders you put them on, and what they'd do, they'd pull them up on the railroad cars. They were one-room shanties where families lived. And they had moved them down to where they were going to cut the next timber or whatever. They'd pull them off and the people had their houses and everything else. And went down there and just uh, had, had a ball down there uh, with that day. But anyway, let's get back to here. Amen. But he said that those behind the mill, mill villages, railroad towns, boy, you've got all types of stuff. These are the poorest of people and all the firstborn of the beast. Look at verse 6. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt. Now we're talking about the Pharaoh's house down to the main servant behind the mill. God is not selective in his judgment of the wicked. I want you to understand. You say, well, these poor Egyptians didn't have a chance. Oh, we're finding out they did. Because a mixed multitude came out of Egypt with Israel when they came. This was not just Jews that came out. They were what we would call Jewish proselytes. They were ones that came to the God of Israel that were actually Egyptians. And we find here that Moses was great and these people are listening. So he said, all the firstborn of the land, they're going to die. Verse number six, a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor should be like it anymore. The greatest tragedy that ever hit. Look at verse 7, but against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue 
against man or beast that you may know how the Lord has put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Look at verse 8. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me. Now he's talking to, to Pharaoh. He said, your servants are going to come down to me and bow themselves unto me, saying, get thee out and all the people that follow thee. And after that, he said, I'll go out. These are the lost Egyptians. Now you've got some that are going to go with them. The majority of them just will not. Uh, we live not only in a day to day where a few there be that find it. But most people have not, they're not really looking for God. They're not really interested. They're interested in religion. What is religion? It's like a coat you can put on Sunday morning, take it off Sunday night. A uh, little, I call it brill, brill cream religion, a little dabble, do you? That's all they're really looking for. Uh, boy, hey, you look out the Bible belt. This is the buckle of the Bible belt right here. Where you live is the buckle. Right in the center of the Bible Belt, you look how things have changed in the last 30 years. From blue laws, I mean, stores didn't open up on Sunday mornings after church. Couldn't sell liquor on Sundays. I mean, they had they had laws down here in the South because they still had a little integrity in the South. But what happened was now, within a few days, they're going to have uh, sipping and strolling on the square again. Everybody's going to go around and sample their wine and drink their booze. And it's kind of, uh, you know, we, we have the little pig fest squealing on the square down there. But they're going to have drinking on the square downtown. And our mayor and all our city council and all these people that go to church are good with it. Opening up a brand new bar down on the square. They get ready to open that up in the next few days. A uh, little nightclub down on the square. And this is in the heart of the Bible Belt. Now, the farther we get going, people do not want what we've got. These people, they, hey, they're going to come to him, and they're going to say, you get out. We're going to stay with Pharaoh. I believe I'd have got on the other side of the fence. Now, this is when he said, and he Moses went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. Not only did Pharaoh turn against God, but most of the people turned against God. Verse number nine, the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you. I told you, Moses. I told you before you were, you know, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God told him, Pharaoh is not going to let these people go. God said, I'm going to have to do something in Israel or in Egypt. And I know how to break them. Let me tell you, God knows how to break America. Now, you wait and see. I've, I've, I've already told you our economy cannot stand what they're doing right now. They are knocking the financial props out from under our nation. Borrowing trillions of dollars. These to them, it's not money. What is a trillion dollars? Do you know how many people you can feed and make millionaires out of for a trillion dollars? That's a number that, that we can't. Our closest neighbor star, let me tell you what four trillion is, okay? Our, our closest neighbor star is Alpha Centauri. A lot of people don't know that. It's about four trillion miles away. It's about four light years actually away from us. Light years is the distance that a ray of light will travel in a year at 186,000 miles per second. It's pretty swift. It takes a year for it to go what's called a light year. So it's about 4.4, 4.5 trillion miles. Now they're talking about $2 trillion bar it and throw it away and $2 trillion more bar it and throw it away. So that's about four light years in time. Our fastest rocket ship in space We'll move at about 36,000 miles per hour. That's a time and a half around the Earth in an hour. It would only take a rocket ship leaving Earth to go to Alpha Centauri 81,000 years. And they're looking for another planet to relocate to. There's nothing in our solar system. Our closest star is 81,000 
years away. Now, I'm talking about absolute foolishness, all right? God has done a great thing here. God has said, hey, Moses, these people, they're not going to listen. The people are not going to listen. What's God doing in America? God, hey, our people in America are still not listening. God did the same thing in Egypt, and he did it almost 4,000 years ago. Now, notice what he said, verse 10, and Moses and Aaron did all these wonders, or Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Go back to uh, Romans chapter number nine, and I'm just going to deal with this again because it's really prevalent in our time. You have what you call hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism. Matter of fact, they don't like that word, so what you hear is they call it reformed theology. How many of you heard that word? Uh, reform comes out of Reformation period. It just simply means that God didn't die for everybody. He died for a select few. If you're not one of this select or one of God's elect, that, you know, and uh, uh, they even talked about the uh, uh, non-elected babies. That these little babies that die, if they're not part of the elect, they go to hell. Now, you're talking about wicked. They're saying that our God doesn't love these little unborn children and these little children that, that are innocent. Listen, children are innocent until they become accountable through their knowledge. God loves these children. God loves these kids. They're saying this God up in heaven said that one having and the other not having done good or evil. I've got two sons. It's like me saying, well, I choose to love one of my sons, give him everything I've got. But this other one, having not done anything wrong, I'm going to hate him, and I'm going to just, I'm going I'm to kill him, I'm going to put him out of my life, I'm going to do away with him. Now, what kind of a parent would I be? Oh, you'd hang me, wouldn't you? That's what they're saying about God. God created these people with no choice of salvation one way or the other. The Bible says God is love, not he tries to be loved. God is just. God is righteous. God is holy. God is. These are attributes of God. Now, when you get down to here, we find Pharaoh. The Lord hardened his heart. But you need to understand that Pharaoh was already hardened spiritually before he ever came, before he ever got to that throne. That's why God chose him. God knew he would never let these people go for any reason, that he would fight against God with everything that he had. God understood that, and for this cause, God raised him up and put him on that throne. But when he hardened his heart, even somebody that is hardened by God can still make some right decisions. You know, lost people make right decisions. Decisions have consequences, but you've got saved people that make right decisions and make wrong ones. You've got lost people that make right decisions and make wrong ones. He could have let them go and said, hey, we've had enough. You go ahead and just get out of the land, and we're going to enjoy our life without your God and without your people either one. He could have done that. But God hardened his heart so that God could do something in chapter number 12. What it, it's called the Lord's Passover. A token of blood to be shed. Deliverance by God, not deliverance by Moses. What, what God wanted Israel to know and Egypt to know that it was not Moses that delivered him. It was God that's going to deliver them. It's not us that gets the work done. We're servants of God. But if anything is done today, it's going to be God that does it. If God doesn't do it, then it's all in vain to start with. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, verse 10, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Oh, he's going to find out. He's going to thrust them out. Buddy. Now God is going to do something now. I'm just going to read a couple of verses in chapter 12. We're going to stop. The Lord spake unto Moses. And Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year for you. And he starts in verse 3, saying, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Why did God do what he did? 
He's not only going to deliver them, and by the way, he's not through. He's going to deliver them through the Red Sea. We'll see that. He's going to deliver them through hunger and thirst. He's going to deliver them all the way around. But God is getting ready to start something because, see, when Jacob went down to Egypt, they were not a nation. It was a man and his sons. But when they come out 430 years later, there's probably, they give the estimation that the Jews at that time, and you can you can go through and get some figures. I did, I'm just going to give you their estimation. Three and one half million Jews. came out of Egypt 430 years later. A powerful, powerful, powerful nation is coming out, and it's going to be God's elect, not individuals. Today, Israel over here is God's elect. That's his nation. No, no weapon formed against them is going to prosper. I'm going to tell you that. God is on their side, but they've rejected Christ. So they're not saved. They're into Judaism. They're, uh, they've gone into that works type situation. A lot of them over there, they have no religion at all. You've got Orthodox, and then you've got the new modern Jews that don't believe in the heaven, hell, God, or anything else. But the nation itself is elect. We're going to deal with that tonight. Hey, God's going to deal with Israel. But we find he's going to bring them out, and he's going to do it through what's called the Passover. Let's go, Lord, prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. Sunday school this morning, pray you'd bless the service to come. I pray for people that are not able to be here this morning. I just, God, watch over and protect them. And, and Lord, we'd love to see some of them be able to be here tonight. We've got some sick, some working. But I pray you'd give us a good day today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, going to the prayer rooms.